And welcome back to Sports Talk. Doug Miles and uh, Don Henderson as we come to you on a uh, Monday, December 5th, after a very busy weekend of sports. Lots of things going on, but uh, particularly, Don, a lot of uh, local uh, sports stories that uh, some of them made national news, but a lot of things happening uh, in our area, so we wanted to kind of get into that. And I guess we'll start off, Don, uh, uh, kind of a sad note in a sense, but uh, you and I had a chance to not only talk to this man, who's, uh, of course, known worldwide for his IMG uh, tennis Academy and uh, training so many of the top players, Nick Bollettieri, who uh, passed away today at the age of 91. So we want to remember Nick for a couple of minutes. Yeah, at a time, a very controversial figure. As a matter of fact, of course, Agassi, for so many years, he was his personal trainer. Raw brought him at a very, very young age into his uh, camp and school. And then they had a separation, but uh, Bellateri was considered, uh, I guess, uh, Doug, you'd have to say, the primary tennis coach of all time. Yeah, I don't think there's anybody even comes close to that that you would have heard of. I mean, obviously, there might have been a few, but uh, he was the guy that uh, was never shy in front of the camera. I remember Bud Collins, uh, another friend of ours who uh, was down here quite a bit, uh, had him a lot on, you know, the different telecasts, Wimbledon, of course, U.S. Open, but uh, you always saw Nick around, didn't you? Well, they were the big factors at, at the Colony. The Colony was really the tennis headquarters in the winter. Uh, Bud Collins came down and spent a great deal of his uh, – Winner program there, ran a tennis tournament there, uh, got a lot of publicity there. Colony got a lot of publicity, him being there. And, of course, Balateri was the one that came in as sort of an unknown quantity and developed what they considered to be a school of impeccable talent. Really did. Started at the Colony, then moved over to their uh, current location uh, in Bradenton, just a little bit south of uh, of Tampa. And uh, right now, just a multi, uh, seems like a multi-billion dollar business. I don't know if it's that big but it, it's huge and uh, it's not only tennis it's football it's baseball it's all sports but he really started it on those uh, courts at the colony uh, I guess 40 some odd years ago no question about it as you say when you talk about uh, the current facility that they're working in Bradenton uh, it is it is a multi-million dollar factor high school and then a, a graduate high school program in terms of football but it has everything. It has golf. It has tennis. Uh, just a multi-complex with every kind of sports figure you'd want. And you and I had a chance uh, about four years ago when uh, the documentary came out uh, that uh, played at the Sarasota Film Festival on Nick Bollettieri. Uh, was uh, shown in uh, the theater down here. Then I, I believe it was shown on Showtime and uh, different theaters around the country. So uh, you and I had a chance to, to see it there. And uh, he led a, a colorful life, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he surely did. And not, not only that, but uh, I, I thought it was a, one of the better documentaries I've seen because, as you mentioned, uh, he was in the theater that day and had a chance to uh, uh, question him. People in the audience had a chance. Dick Vitale was one that talked to him. And Dick's a big, very big tennis fan and uh, uh, tennis uh, aficionado, I guess you could say, because uh, he uh, uh, really was part of the tennis programs uh, around the Sarasota area and out in in Lakewood Ranch and so forth, but uh, Voluntary was there. He spoke uh, at that time. Uh, he would have been like he died, he said he died at 91. He probably was uh, 88, 87. Yep, I think in that range, two, right. three, three years ago. Yeah, we had a chance to talk to him on radio a couple of times at a station locally. So uh, uh, good guy, interesting man, and uh, left a lot of uh, – you know, great uh, work, uh, not only in his tennis, uh, I guess, well, basically the tennis, but just kind of developing uh, a different style of professional tennis and training tennis that uh, so many players really benefited from. He was difficult. Um, he even told in the interviews, uh, you know, in the, in the documentary, he was hard to, hard to deal with, but you needed to be that way to uh, build a winner. That was his uh, whole, uh, whole op operation, right? Yeah, he had some very unique ideas about how to teach tennis and uh, to bring these players along at a young age, 13, 12, 13, 14, 15, and develop them into going to Wimbledon or, or going to the United States Open or whatever it may be, Australian Open. And uh, his techniques were very, very unique. And yet he himself uh, was not a great tennis player. No. Not that he, <laughs> he grew up you know, as a kid growing up in tennis and developed these skills on his own. These were skills he developed only to teach tennis. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think he started in Brooklyn or somewhere in New York uh, teaching, uh, just kind of in the public courts on his own, right? He was right. Never, a, never a trained player at all, so, yeah. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Never any amateur 
nothing. He never did anything on the amateur side or even in growing up, he was never a, 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 a you know, even a minuscule pro no, player. No, never ranked he or anything, he, right. He wasn't really a player. No, no. But uh, interesting man. So we remember the great Nick Bollettieri. And uh, we'll move on now to uh, some college football news. Of course, the speculation the last uh, few weeks since uh, uh, USF, uh, which uh, we have a chance to cover down here. Uh, they fired their coach, Jeff Scott, who was going to be the new coach. So many names came up. Uh, some made no sense, like uh, John Gruden. Uh, but uh, Deion Sanders looked like he might be the guy. A lot of people wanted him. I think a lot of the USF fans would have loved to have seen it. I would have loved to have seen it. But he winds up going to Colorado. And uh, Alex uh, Golish, a, an assistant uh, coach, the offensive coordinator from Tennessee, gets named as the head coach of the Bulls. And uh, he was introduced to the media earlier today. So uh, another assistant route, Don, very similar to uh, what Jeff Scott did. He came from uh, Clemson. And now uh, you have another assistant coming from uh, Tennessee, a winning program. But uh, I'm not sure, sure USF fans right now are that excited. Yeah, we, the, he was their offensive coordinator at Tennessee. And... Uh, Normally, when uh, the non-Division Five teams go into hiring a coach the first time out, they usually go down and pick up a top assistant, whether he's an offensive or defensive coordinator, and elevate him to a chance to uh, go up, as, as Rule did at Temple. Uh, Rule came into Temple, which was a dying program, right. uh, brought it uh, you know, into a bowl situation in three years, got a really headline name by doing so, but so many have not done that, and uh, the University of South Florida is one that falls in that category. They've gone two or three times now the same route, and uh, my belief is it's very, very difficult today with the competition and the way these players can transfer schools. Uh, University of Central Florida has been uh, a little bit more competitive. Uh, they've moved around and gotten different coaches and still been able to win. But it's very tough for the temples of the world or the University of South Florida, your alma mater. And, of course, I worked with Temple for so many years. It is so difficult to step up in Division One and, and become a relative force by going to the, uh, the root of an, uh, you know, an offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator. You better have a lot of skills of recruiting. That's the thing, and I think that's another reason that uh, you know, if USF uh, could have put the deal together, maybe Dion turned it down. I don't know if he actually turned it down or if they didn't offer it to him, but he wound up in Colorado. But a guy like that, like him or not, I mean, the man did a tremendous job at Jackson State uh, almost by force of will to put that program in the SWAC, basically the black colleges, uh, going undefeated, winning the championship there. I think a guy like that, if he came to Tampa, major market, uh, great facilities. You're playing in an NFL stadium. Perhaps you build the new stadium. I think that's something that, you know, he would have led the charge to get that done quicker. And the recruiting, I mean, he's already been a tremendous recruiter at Jackson State. Already I've heard a couple of names that uh, have decommitted uh, to go to Colorado. So uh, it would have been a lot of fun to have him here. We're not going to get him here. So an assistant now has to go out and uh, try and sell USF. And I don't know how you do that. Uh, they've been relying on the portal now for several years, and you can't build a winner just on the portal. Very, very tough. And I mean, the other thing you mentioned at the top, uh, Temple's been doing the same thing for 20 years now. They've been talking about building a stadium on campus to uh, bring about more uh, alumni uh, participation in the program, all from a donating standpoint, from alumni donations, that they're building a stadium and, and getting it on campus and more uh, internal interest within the school, and University of South Florida has the same problem. I mean, you don't have a stadium on campus. You have to play in an NFL stadium. Or the youngster is going to transfer, uh, you know, take whatever transportation there is to go from the University of South Florida to Raymond James Stadium right. to watch their team play. It doesn't happen very often. No. And they've already lost a, a player, one of their top receivers, to the portal already. So it's going to be a challenge. I wish them well. I mean, I, I want them to do well. It's more fun to cover a team that's, <laughs> that's winning instead of going 1-11 like they did this year. But uh, it's going to be a tough sell for Alex Goshen. Uh, just kind of moving on to uh, more college football, a game you and I uh, have had a chance to go to uh, for several years now. The uh, now called ReliaQuest Bowl, formerly the Outback Bowl, has its matchup. Uh, and it's going to be uh, Illinois against Mississippi State. This will be on January 2nd. Uh, the first is uh, a Sunday. They're going to have NFL games. So uh, we don't go New Year's Day this year, Don. <laughs> no, it's on the 2nd because of the scheduling. Uh, New Year's Day is uh, Sunday. 
and Sunday belongs to the National Football League. So uh, that means that for the uh, the game's going to be on Monday, and it's going to be at 12 noon rather than 1 o'clock, the normal early starting start, time. Right. Uh, early start. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, I don't know how well Illinois travels. I don't know how well Mississippi State travels. Uh, they've had great success. Uh, at, at the, when it was the Outback Bowl, and now, of course, without a quest, as you indicated, the new name this year, a company in Tampa, Florida, that's very, very involved in uh, getting you know national publicity from a bowl game, and it's going to be very interesting to see how the, the two schools travel and uh, how difficult it's going to be to sell tickets. Yeah, we've seen games that have had uh, schools that don't travel well, and the stadium is about... Less than half full. We've also seen games where uh, Florida's been there, and of course, it's almost totally full. So, uh, yeah. Illinois, you might get some of the Midwesterners trying to get out of the cold weather. Mississippi State, I'm not so sure how well they'll travel down to Florida. So, uh, it's a big selling job for our friend uh, Mike, uh, who handles the PR. But uh, no, no matter what, it's always a fun game to go to, but it's not a great, uh, I wouldn't call that a classic matchup. No, you said uh, Mike Spence associated with the bowl down for better than 30, 32, 33, 35 years. I don't know the exact number, but uh, he's always done a terrific job with uh, the media and, and the press relations and all the things that go around the bowl. It's a tremendous trip for the youngsters involved, Illinois and Mississippi State, uh, because they have so many functions between Clearwater, Tampa, uh, all the events that right. go on around that whole week. Uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous uh, opportunity for both schools and their ch- and their youngsters, their football players, to really have a lot of fun. So it'll be interesting to see how this game comes out this year. Uh, Mississippi State, a uh, very competitive team. Illinois was a surprise, better than most people thought. And uh, so it should be a very, very competitive game. And be, well, I'm looking forward to seeing it on the second at 12 noon. Surprisingly lucrative bowl, too. I mean, you just look at some of the numbers that uh, the payout's very good for the colleges. And uh, apparently it brings in a ton of money uh, to the area. So uh, it's a great event to have if you have a bowl game in your city. Uh, and Tampa has two. They have the Gasparilla Bowl as well. Played a little bit earlier in late December. And then now you have the, uh, the ReliQuest Bowl continuing the Outback Bowl tradition. So good to have in your city if you have bowl games. Well, not only that, as you said, uh, so much money has been donated over these 30-plus years uh, since they've had the bowl, and uh, I know that'll continue this year. So it's a tremendous yep. uh, advantage for the city of, you know, just for the city itself, uh, as well as the kids. Moving on to baseball, the uh, Tampa Bay Rays have a, a bit of a, a challenge right now. Last week they announced that uh, because of the Hurricane Ian, which hit uh, the end of September, now, I didn't realize this, Don, I didn't uh, know there was that type of damage to their spring training home in uh, Charlotte uh, County, Charlotte Park, that uh, it was still that bad, but the Rays announced last week they will not be able to play their spring training games there, so they're looking for another place to play. Uh, I suggested in a tweet, whoever wants to listen or pays attention to me on Twitter, which is probably nobody, but why not share the stadium (laughs) with uh, either the Yankees in Tampa or with uh, the Orioles here in Sarasota? Be a good marketing promotion for either way. Well, I would think they'd be more inclined to come to Sarasota because, uh, you know, you're in a situation there where uh, they they tried to move further south right. uh, to set up their training camp to begin with. I, I did not realize it until you emailed me that uh, they were in this desperate condition with their, uh, you know, spring training site. It, it's only been open for, what, four years? Not, they, not, not they long. Just no. built the, right. Yeah, they just built the whole complex. I mean, uh, but it came through more than two. As we all know, we were right there between Venice and uh, and Naples, uh, really more from Fort Myers. Uh, the, the hurricane was so bad and so much damage, but I didn't realize it had uh, had damaged the ballpark to that degree. Yeah, I did not either. I mean, you heard stories, obviously, the you know the homes and things, but I did not hear about the stadium being particularly. You know, two months later, that the Rays would announce that. I guess they were hoping that it was going to be fixed in time, but obviously uh, not. Uh, oh, call the Rays also, remember about six months ago, they announced they were going to look for another spring training home anyway up in Pasco County. They were going to leave there. So, I don't know. Well, they had uh, t- supposedly $10 million allocated from uh, Governor DeSantis and, and the uh, administration, right? Uh, the Rep- Republican administration in Tampa, and uh, that was taken away. 
uh, at least uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know that it's been restored. I don't think so. No, uh, no, no. I, I, I think it was that was uh, taken away, and I so I don't know what they're going to do now. Whether how they're going to go about approaching this, building either a new facility or going back to where they are and reconstructing, or, or how much damage has actually been done. But uh, let's face it, they want a new location for everything. They want a new location right. for the team. They want a new location for the city. And now they want a new location for their tent, for their spring training site. So uh, I'll tell you, although they just spent $10 million for a player, which surprised me a little bit, but uh, they don't usually spend that kind of money. But uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. The stadium issue, obviously, the trop. Uh, they want to get out of that lease, which uh, I think has three years left. Uh, but if you're going to ask uh, taxpayers to kick in for another spring training facility, a new one, uh, there's no way that's going to happen. So, uh, no, uh, I don't, they're not going to kick in for a new stadium either. Nope. I don't think. Uh, I don't think the people in Tampa are going to do it. I don't think the people in Tampa are sure. going to do it. Yeah, Probably no, I don't either. No. I think, no. Yeah, I think there are a lot of teams right now that. Uh, you know, think that they're going to come in with, with uh, you know, government money and build stadiums. And uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen too no. much more. I mean, people just can't afford it. We'll wrap up with this final note of speaking of the Rays, former uh, Ray, I believe he was on the original Devil Rays when they were called that, uh, Fred McGriff. Uh, he actually gets inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame, the uh, uh, Special Veterans Committee uh, for players, I believe, that played uh, after 1980, uh, elected him in. So uh, an outstanding ball player. I got to see, uh, you know, you and I, as we watch the game, saw him play. I believe he has 493 career home runs, uh, just under 2,500 career hits, uh, right around 300, maybe 280 hitter. Outstanding fielder, good all-around ball player. So uh, congratulations to him. Fred McGriff. No question about it. And uh, I didn't realize he had played. Uh, I did not recollect it until I read the paper how many teams he had actually played for. Quite a few. You know, he was originally, yeah, he was originally drafted by the New York Yankees. And uh, then was in a, a trade for Murphy and went up to Toronto. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, he moved on from there, as you mentioned. Uh, did a tremendous job of hitting home runs. Was, was always in contention. Talked about being in the Hall of Fame. Never really quite made it. And a lot of you were surprised this time that uh, Mattingly, Mattingly didn't make it. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought he was going to make it, too, along with Murphy. And they were going to be a triumphant going in. But it turns out only one person, Fred McGriff, uh, goes in because Mattingly didn't make it, Barry Bonds didn't make it, Roger Clemens didn't make it, uh, Palmero didn't make it, uh, Kurt Schilling didn't make it, Albert Bell didn't make it, Dale Murphy didn't make it. They all fell short. Uh, many people thought that the uh, the Stain players wouldn't make it, but they did think that Murphy was going to make it, and they also thought that uh, you know the, the great Yankee first baseman uh, when Mattingly was going to make it, but he came up. Uh, I think two votes, one vote or two votes short. Yeah, I think about one or two short, right. Yeah, well, think of Mattingly. We and I talked about this before on the phone. Uh, Hall of Fame career for about, oh, four or five years. And, of course, the back injury, I believe it was a spinal problem that just kind of hampered him the last couple of years. And he just never could get that, uh, you know, 10, 15-year 18-year career in to, to really get up to the – he would have had a three – he would have been 3,000 hits easily if he was healthy. Yeah, yeah. He, in fact, he pointed out himself. He did a show, uh, uh, and with the two uh, baseball writers from the New York Post this last week, uh, they were pushing very hard. John Heyman and and uh, Joel pushing very hard for him to get into the Hall of Fame, and uh, he didn't make it. But he pointed out himself that uh, the shortcomings uh, were things that he could do nothing about. The back injury really it just took him out of out of contention the last couple of years, and his career just didn't last as long as he would like it to. Uh, and, and he really said himself that it's a matter of judgment now when you're voting for the Hall of Fame, do his numbers and the length of his career and all that, uh, do they you know, justify going into the Hall of Fame? And unfortunately, this group of people who are voting this time, it did not. But the only player, I think, that they factored in – uh, length of career, or at least length of Hall of Fame years, probably with Sandy Koufax, right? Those five tremendous years, because uh, you didn't have a first 
first three or four years, not very good at all. He only played, I think, nine years, and it was those last five that put him in the Hall of Fame. Maybe Gale Sayers, he might say, in football, had those tremendous five or six years he had to retire because of an injury. But very rarely in baseball do they uh, look at the, you know, if you have a, a short span of Hall of Fame numbers, do you get in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, you gotta be uh you gotta be very fortunate. Kofax of course was the most dominant pitcher of his era, but very short time as you said, About nine five years. Seasons. Yeah. Yeah, Roberto Clemente of course went in right away because uh uh he was on that uh, voluntary mission taking food over and the plane crashed, so he went in right away on the next year. Uh it wasn't a matter of looking at stats at uh he was certainly uh, qualified for the. But he, for the he had three thousand hits. So I mean, he he would have played almost twenty years at that point, or close to it. Oh, so, he was, so he had the he numbers. Was, he would have gotten in no matter what. But yeah, they made a special uh, voting where they got him in right away. You're right. Yeah, he, he was the one player that was. Uh, Branch Rickey made the mistake on. Uh, Branch Rickey made so many great moves. Right, as right. General manager, general manager of the Dodgers, and uh, when they were in Brooklyn, and he didn't put him on the forty man roster, he thought that. Uh, People would overlook him. Well, they didn't overlook him. The Pittsburgh Pirates took him right away. And, of course, he became 20 years later one of the great players of all time in Pittsburgh and in baseball. Yeah, great, great, uh, great player. Well, anyway, we congratulate Fred McGriff. But that'll wrap it up for uh, this edition of uh, the Sports Talk. Just want to really, we had so many things done that involved not uh, not only nationally, but uh, particularly here in our area in Tampa Bay. So uh, Tampa Bay is on the sports map every occasionally. (laughs) <laughs> no question about that. And uh, as Pat Williams tells us, Tampa Bay and, and uh, what's happening in the Florida area, he wants to see those Rays move down to, to uh, Orlando. Right. So we'll see what happens with that, too. That'll be interesting. Maybe he, he might be offering for them to come there for spring training. I didn't even think of that. We'll have to ask him about that. All right. I, I got you. We'll we'll find out about that. But, Don, good talking with you, and uh, we'll do it again real soon. Thanks for watching, everybody.